Our guest on This is America and the World is journalist E.J. Dion. He's an opinion columnist for The Washington Post, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and co-author, along with Miles Rappaport, of the new book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. E.J., great to be with you once again. It is great to be back with you, Dennis, and we share our great southeastern mass root, uh, southeastern New England roots. I from Fall River and you from Cranston, which is great. (laughs) Cranston, Rhode Island, birthplace, and grew up in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Very proud of that. Uh, But great to be with you. Congratulations on your new book. You got a new book? Uh, Thank you so much. Just coming out. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to start at square one your definition, and what are the pillars of democracy? So democracy, first and foremost, means that everybody, every citizen should be able to vote unobstructed and easily. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have throughout our history struggled to include everyone as part of our democracy. And we had a long way to go. We started out as a country where essentially only white property owners could vote. Mm -hmm. And over a long period, we extended democracy uh, to mean first all white men. Uh, We broadened the franchise to include uh, black Americans during reconstruction. Then we had a lot of regress and we've had real cycles of uh, inclusion and exclusion. Uh, We included women after the turn of the uh, 20th century, and we finally included everybody uh, with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now we're taking some steps backward again Mm. uh, after what should be a cause for celebration, which is uh, the extraordinary voter turnout of 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But obviously the kind of democracy I have in mind is liberal democracy, which is not a political position, but a democracy that depends on everyone's freedom to argue, to publish, to believe what they want. And so what you need is a guarantee of people's rights uh, to express themselves in the public debate and the ability to express themselves at the polls. So here we are now, 2022, uh, threats to our democracy, and the country is just torn apart, huh? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know about you. I've tried to think a lot about whether we are more divided now than we were, say, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, in the okay. Vietnam period. Okay. Um, and this division feels deeper to me uh, than those divisions felt then. And, and we were pretty divided, as we both recall um, back then. Um, But we didn't go through a period then where one candidate lost the election and denied that he lost the election. We didn't go through a period where people fundamentally questioned the workings of uh, uh, the voting system. Uh, We questioned it in the sense of exclusion, which is why we fought for voting rights. Uh, But we didn't go through what we've been through the last several years. And obviously, we didn't go through the attack on the Capitol that we saw Uh, on January 6th, which is uh, an indicator, the period that this unfortunately reminds me most, and um, neither of us lived through it, was the period of the 1850s before the Civil War, where you saw a kind of very deep division, even more regionally rooted than this one is, which is why we did have a Civil War, uh, over deep, uh, the, the question then was slavery, and fortunately that is not the issue now, but I think that when you read the history of the 1850s, this feels an awful lot like that, and that's not a very encouraging co- comparison. In, in modern times, just in, in recent history, uh, how did we get from disagreeing with each other politically, which is part of the game in, in America, uh, to anger? at each other and actually violence and the threat of violence. I mean, we've traveled from the Tea Party to Trump and now it's 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 not a pleasant place to be sometimes, huh? Well, I sort of w- want to do this a half analytically and then the other half a bit more pointed. I think the analytical part is that more than ever 
people's partisan identities are wrapped up with all sorts of other aspects of their identities. Uh, their views about religion uh, are a big part of it. Obviously, divisions around race, which of course we've seen before uh, in our history, um, we don't even live near people we disagree with anymore to the same degree that we used to. Um, there, there's been some great work on this that shows that uh, neighborhood that people are tend to live in more politically homogeneous neighborhoods uh -huh. uh, than they used to. Um, and the churches they go to are more politically homogeneous. So all kinds of aspects of our lives kind of come back to political identity. That's the analytical point. Um, and then I think, um, you know, and people might want to argue with me about this, although I think the data is pretty clear. I think you've also seen over a long period of time, a, a radicalization of the Republican Party, uh, which I think you've seen a little bit of during the hearings uh, around Judge Jackson, um, which I think uh, has, um, you know, made this, made the divisions uh, even deeper. Uh, and so I think there are analytical reasons about how we live and how we arrange ourselves. And then I think there is some real change uh, in the Republican Party. I joke that my dirty little secret is that I was a teenage liberal Republican. That's a dirty secret because I can't think of a more boring thing to be as a teenager than a liberal Republican. Uh, but there are none of those folks anymore. Uh, you know, and I think that party has gone through an awful lot of change over a period of time. Before we go to the break, take a minute out and define what the Democrats stand for and what you see the Republicans stand for. Um, th this sounds like a, a question my AP history teacher would ask, and I had a great AP history uh, teacher from Middletown, uh, or Middletown or Newport, I think, he, I think he lived in Middletown, Rhode Island. Um, you know, I think at this point in history, the Democrats stand for um, a more significant degree of government intervention in the economy to make it more equal, uh, more government regulation to protect the environment, protect worker rights, the Republicans stand for less uh, regulation. I think some of those are long standing arguments that you had between the two parties. And by the way, a lot of those uh, arguments were compromisable. Uh, I might want to spend uh, $40 billion on something that Republicans might want to spend $10 billion on. And there's some room to negotiate those kinds of things. Uh, it's harder now. Uh, the differences are there. And then I think on balance, the Democrats are the more socially liberal party on civil rights um, and racial justice on issues like abortion and LGBTQ rights and the Republican Party is the more conservative party. I think the difference between now and, you know, 35 or 40 years ago is that both parties had much more mixed up coalitions back then. You had radically segregationist Southern Democrats uh, and you had very liberal Republicans from the parts of the world, part of the world where we came from. I think of the late John Chafee, the great mm -hmm. Senator from uh, Rhode Island, who was one of the leading Republican who was one of the country's leading environmentalists. You just don't have that crisscross now that you had uh, before. There are advantages to where we are now. The choices are clearer, but there are disadvantages in terms of creating uh, you know, cross-party alliances on particular issues. Give me, uh, give me a, your a parallel view of the Republican Party. In what sense? Well, you say that uh, the Democrats are more socially minded, government oh, more involved. You no, know, I, I was trying to do both together. In other words, I think but the I Republican wanna, Party. Wanna, yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, I think the Republican Party uh, does not believe that the capitalist system needs the degree of regulation uh, that Democrats see the system needing. Uh, they're both capitalist parties, but one is capitalism with significant regulation, the Republicans with significantly less. Um, the Republicans tend to stand for, especially since uh, uh, George H.W. Bush got into trouble for raising taxes to balance the budget. They have been uh, resolutely opposed to uh, um, tax increases, although they've, uh, uh, they've occasionally supported them. 
uh, they tend to, but they are also more, as I said earlier, more socially conservative around issues like LGBTQ rights, abortion, um, and civil rights. Do you feel that the Republican Party is pro-democracy? I think the Republican Party right now is split, unfortunately, on democracy. Wow. Uh, I think you have some Republicans, and not just Liz Cheney and not just Adam Kinzinger. Um, I think Mitt Romney, for example, who believe passionately in democracy. But I think uh, folks who are willing to uh, deny some section of the public the right to vote or the, or the ease of voting compared to other groups, and I think people who go along with the big lie about uh, the uh, 2020 election are undermining democracy. So I, I wish I could answer, sure, but I don't see it right now. Let us uh, take a little break. Uh, we're talking with E.J. Dion, Washington Post op-ed columnist, uh, always a pleasure to read, uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author, co-author of a new book along with Miles Rappaport, 100% uh, Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. We're going to get to that in just a couple of seconds. Sit tight. This is America and the World. This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. 21st Century Citizenship. The Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy. EJ, we've talked about the division of America, the, they call it the polarization of America, yet we seem to be united as a country, and you've written about this, as to how Americans see Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, uh, President Zelensky as a fighter for freedom, uh, democracy, justice, in a strange way, he's brought the country together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think you're 100% uh, 100 right. I think both parties would love to invite Zelensky to talk to their next convention. Uh, and I, I think what you're seeing here are a couple of things. One is just blatant aggression. I, I don't know how else to describe uh, what uh, President Putin is doing in uh, Ukraine, but blatant aggression. There was no cause for this invasion. Ukraine did not threaten Russia. Uh, secondly, the sheer brutality of the war uh, that we're seeing night after night on television and the, what uh, families losing children and, and fellow family members, the destruction of cities that's going on, um, it, there is just uh, almost unanimous support uh, for Ukraine uh, as the victim here, and they are the victims here. Um, and then I think Zelensky has had extraordinary clarity uh, and great success in rallying his country. I think even our own intelligence agencies, when this war started, uh, did not believe that the Ukrainians could stand up to the Russian onslaught to the degree that they have. And um, and Zelensky speaks the language of democracy and self-determination um, in a way that's really powerful. He did that uh, to the American Congress. He did it to the uh, in the parliament in Britain. He did it at the Bundestag in Germany. I mean, he's made himself a spokesman for democracy and self-determination around the world. And bringing us together somewhat. Let me ask you, uh, before we talk a little bit about the book, uh, 2022, 2024, uh, is there a possibility that um, a Jim Jordan could be the Speaker of the House? Uh, 2024, Steve Bannon be the Secretary of State? Uh, is are those possibilities? Um, I won't say all the things that went through my head as you were talking, <laughs> because we're, we're trying to have a polite, good conversation here. Just to go back to the question you asked earlier to answer this one, um, I do think that 
uh, Lord knows I wish none of this suffering were happening in Ukraine, but I think its impact on us, on the United States, uh, could be more positive than not. What you're seeing is people who had been apologists for Putin uh, before this attack uh, have had to back up and say, wait a minute, you know, well, you know, kind of absurd things like, well, this wasn't the Putin I knew to actually in, in the rare case admitting outright they were wrong. And so I think there is a bit of uh, a reassessment going on on the right. I think there are still parts of the far right that are still apologetic for Putin. But, um, you know, this has made their their old positions are an embarrassment for them. And this isn't just happening uh, in the United States, far right leaders in Germany and France and elsewhere uh, have had to back away from things that they uh, said about Putin. The uh, 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 Ms. Le Pen's party in France had to pulp 1.2 million leaflets that had a picture of her and Vladimir Putin. And they decided that wouldn't work well in this presidential election. So I think there is a sort of a, something of a pushback against that. Having said that, uh, I think it's very obvious that both these elections, 2022 and 2024, are wide open. Um, Republicans certainly seem to have the edge right now in 2022, although the Senate, I think, is the race for the Senate is going to be uh, tighter uh, and on the current numbers in the race for the House. 2024, I always say that on midnight of election night in 2016, I turned in my membership card in the prognosticators union. Uh, so I sure as heck am not going to try to make any predictions about 2024. 100% <laughs> democracy. Everyone must vote, a civic responsibility. Talk a little bit about the new book. Right, thank you. And thanks for mentioning my great co-author, uh, Miles Rappaport, who is former secretary of state in Connecticut and has spent a lot of his life trying to expand access to the ballot. This idea that we have seems, you know, uh, peculiar to Americans, but it's been in force in about two dozen countries around the world with enormous success in a country a lot of us Americans relate to quite easily, which is Australia. Australia established this system uh, in 1924, and the idea is that voting is both a right uh, and a duty. And under the Australian system, everyone, the government makes enormous efforts to help everybody register. They make enormous efforts to make it easy for everyone to vote. But the what you have to do is you have to vote. If you don't vote, you get a little notice from the government and you pay what I think now amounts to in American dollars, you could pay a $14 fine. Oh. So it's like an inexpensive, par you know, it's like a parking ticket. And under the Australian system, they don't do this because they want to penalize people. Only about 13, 15% of the people ever have to pay the fine. You get a little notice. If you have a legit excuse of some kind, they say, sure. But they hold elections on a Saturday, which makes it very easy for everyone to vote. Um, and uh, elections are, as somebody told the New York Times, a voter in Australia are like a party. Um, people, ex everybody's expected to vote. Uh, polling places are are surrounded by uh, people pushing good causes, raising money for schools, raising money uh, for the neighborhood. Australians talk about uh, democracy sausages, where everybody has a sausage sizzle and you buy a sausage to give um, uh, money to a good cause. We propose that in the U.S. we could now have vegan alternatives to the <laughs> democracy sausage for those who wanted them. But what you do is you produce turnouts of close to 90% in state and federal uh, elections. But what you also do that we stress is the whole bias of the system shifts from any effort to make it harder to vote, because if it's your duty to vote, then government's job at every level is to make it as easy as possible for you to carry out your duty. And the analogy we make is to jury duty. Uh, which can actually be far more onerous if you get stuck on a long trial uh, than having to uh, go cast a ballot. Um, and um, you know, jury duty requires everybody to serve, but it does that so that the jury pool includes everybody. Mm -hmm. One of the great advances of the civil rights movement was including everyone on juries. And that meant 
that black Americans, like white Americans, would be subject to the compulsion to serve. The only, the last point I want to make is, uh, this is, you don't have to cast a ballot for anyone. You can cast a blank ballot. Um, you can draw Dennis Holy's picture on it if you want. Uh -huh. uh, you, under our fine system, it would not be criminal. You could not compound it. And you could get rid of the fine by doing an hour of community service. Uh -huh. We're not looking to penalize people. We're trying to create an ethic where everybody feels the duty to vote and where the system operates in favor of making it easy for people to vote. Uh, you mentioned about a 90% turnout in Australia, a huge turnout in 2020 here. What, what was the number? What was the percentage? 66.8. 66.8. Uh, which is a great turnout for us. It's not a bad turnout in international terms. We make the point that in our Declaration of Independence, uh, the founders said that uh, government is only legitimate if it has the consent of the governed. And we can't resist pointing out that it didn't say if it has the consent of 66.8% uh, yeah, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, governed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other reason we like the system is right now, who gets political information in the country? Who gets pulled to the polls? It's those likely voters. And we argue that this is like treating elections as a fancy dinner party, there's an A list and a B uh, list yeah, and a yeah, C yeah. list. Yeah. Uh, our, under our system, there are no B, B or C list voters, and therefore candidates have to appeal to everybody. We think it would make the electorate younger. Uh, we think it would make it um, uh, more more inclusive of people of lower income. And this is from evidence elsewhere. And it would probably make the electorate more moderate because the people who don't vote tend to be less ideological uh, than the people who do. So 60 plus uh, in 2020, sometimes you look at, uh, forget about primaries, but regular national elections. And it's embarrassing the low turnout that we have here. 2014 midterms was around 36%. Oh, Lord. Oh my uh, you know, and the average midterm turnouts tend to be, which elect a lot of governors, by the way, who are rather important people in our governing system, um, are around 40 percent. So we can do we can do better. And we did do better. I, I, that's the other thing that troubles me is where states that are trying to make it harder to vote. We showed in 2020 that if you made it easier for people to vote, they take advantage of it. I'm right, right, right. very proud. I cast my ballot at a drop box in front of our kids' high school, which is named after Walt Whitman, the great uh, poet of democracy. And so, uh, you know, it was easier to vote because of the pandemic. We shouldn't need a pandemic to make it easier for people to vote. Wow. 100% democracy, the case for universal voting. And we have to pay our taxes, as you said, serve on the a jury, you have to get a driver's license. So this idea, uh, can I couple that with making Election Day in the United States a national holiday? Or yes, Saturday? I agree with that. We are for that, too. I think that it doesn't, you know, you can pick any day of the week. I sort of like the Italians who have historically voted on Sunday and Monday morning, just Monday morning, just in case you went away for the weekend. <laughs> you have been uh, writing, raising a family, educated, Tell me something about life. Tell me a lesson, a personal lesson that you've learned, not about politics or Washington, but what, what personal lesson have you learned that uh, you use today to navigate through life? One of the things I always have always told our kids is that every single person on this earth that you encounter has something to teach you. And it doesn't matter if they got a PhD or they didn't graduate from high school, it doesn't matter what they do uh, for a living. Um, there are people out there, everyone knows things you don't know, has experienced things you haven't experienced. Um, and so, you know, there's a twin lesson there, which is I think we are all endowed with equal dignity and we should treat each other uh, with dignity uh, as people who have dignity. Uh, but we should also be open to learning from everybody on earth. I think one of the best things about being a journalist is you have an excuse to talk to anybody and people forgive you when you ask them questions uh, and when you encounter them. 
Um, and I have learned a lot from people of all kinds in my life. And that's sort of a, a lesson I still think about a lot. And it's something I really tried to teach our kids. Do the kids receive that lesson well? Yeah, so far they, they uh, I mean, uh, you know, we all think our kids are great, but I, uh, and I certainly think that of mine, but yeah, they do, uh, they are curious and they are respectful of other people. And that's one of the, my wife and I desperately wanted them to learn that lesson. Terrific, EJ. 100% uh, democracy, the case for universal voting. Co-author EJ Dion with Miles Rappaport. We'll put up on the screen uh, a, a connection to Brookings and people can learn more about how they can get the book because I think it's a terrific idea. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. Great to what be with you. What a joy to see you again. It's great. Thanks so much. We'll do it again. Take care. Thank you. All right. This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. 21st Century Citizenship. The Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy.